Welcome back to stage one. Um, I'm super excited to welcome Jasmine Hex to the stage. Jasmine is the director of cybersecurity at Esper, an Android DevOps startup in Seattle. Jasmine loves cloud security and DevOps and has fallen in love with governance, risk, and compliance. Jasmine's talk is Punk Compliance, DIY Security Audit Readiness for Everyone. All you. Hi, Leah. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I know that, that there's a lot of amazing talks on the Di Diana Initiative schedule today. And when given a choice, compliance is, is really the most appealing option. <laughs> So thank you for attending this talk. Um, thank you to the organizers and thank you to our sponsors as well um, for helping us put on this event. Um, who am I? Um, I'm, I'm Jasmine Henry. I also respond to Jasmine Hex. Um, I am a, a security director at a fast growing Seattle startup. We do not have a security product, um, so I'm not selling anything. And I also am not claiming to speak on behalf of the punk movement. Um, I have identified with, with counterculture movements uh, since my teen years. Um, and I've always been somebody who has not fit the mold or the standard. I think that's something that many of us in security have in common is having felt like an outsider. And not only have I felt like an outsider at times in my life to, to kind of mainstream culture, I've also felt like a security industry outsider at many points during my career. Um, it was really hard for me to break in just because my pathway is not perfectly traditional and neither am I. Um, I faced a lot of rejection, especially early in my career, uh, trying to break into security roles. My undergraduate degree was not in computer science um, and I started off in help desk. At the time I thought that I would never get where I wanted to go it was also 2010, so the job market was terrible. Um, but I really felt like I'd failed. And I wish I'd been kinder to myself because I think that Help Desk is a great launch pad for a lot of us. Um, I am mentored by an amazing woman CISO, um, Dee Young. And she also started in Help Desk. And we both agree that it's, it's an amazing um, set of experiences for security people. So early in my career, I was rejected because I had literally zero experience. Um, I got into project management and I got a, a master's degree in analytics next because I was tired of hearing that I wasn't technical enough. After that, um, I started doing more program management. Um, that's also the point in my career where I started working a lot more with cloud and DevOps. And I did some consulting for a few years and I was often rejected because I didn't have premises-based networking experience. <laughs> um, and I've, I've gained it. Um, I'm, I'm glad to tell you that it gets easier as you, as you gain more experience, you face fewer rejections. And now I get a lot of messages um, on LinkedIn and Twitter kind of questioning my qualifications, but I think that it just goes to show that there's always gonna be trolls. Um, and it's okay. Uh, you know, so I'm not a typical person. I don't fit the mold, but I also drive exceptional results. Um, last year, I passed three compliance audits in six months. I was hired um, last year as the first US woman employee at a, at a startup. Uh, we had a little bit less than 40 staff at the time. And, um, Several months later, we, we were going to sign a Fortune 500 customer and we had to put security policies and controls automation into place in order to pass the risk assessment. I think this is kind of a common pathway for a lot of small businesses and startups where compliance and security are really customer driven and that there's a hesitation to invest in these things before a customer's asking for it. So September was kind of the, the turning point where my focus fully shifted to security. Shout out to Rin Oliver, by the way. At the time we were working together um, and, and Rin handled that transition with a lot of grace because they're amazing. 
Um, please don't miss Rin's keynote tomorrow at um, 4.30. So a couple months later, it took the uh, it took the customer a couple months to review, you know, kind of our, our risk assessment and decide they were going to sign us. And part of the contract said that we had to pass three audits um, on a very short period of time. We had to be basically done with the audits and submit reports by by June first. So we found an audit firm really really quickly, and we dug in. I was the only dedicated security and compliance person at the organization at the time. I had a lot of help. Uh, we have an amazing cloud and DevOps team, amazing program managers, amazing engineers. It turned out that we had an employee who was a nationally award-winning pen tester um, in college and high school. So he was able to do some pen testing for us. You know, we made it work. And in the past few months, my company has had a Series B funding round. Um, and we're really starting to scale. I'm creating a 24-7 SOC currently, um, really scaling controls, um, creating a 24-7 capacity for security support, and, and growing my program. Um, the decision's been made that uh, security at my company is gonna own IT. So that's, that's another area I'm building, and I'm really excited. But before I kind of get into talking about what I've learned on this journey um, and how I'm leveling up, I wanted to kind of create some, some definitions around security and compliance. Compliance is not security, and that may be the only thing that people on InfoSec Twitter can agree on. Um, audits don't prove security. Um, even the, the standards organizations will tell you that compliance is a minimum set of security requirements. Compliance is doing the bare minimum. And that's, that's to paraphrase the, the words of the PCI DSS Council. Um, compliance is a really valuable business tool, however, even though it's not the same as security. Um, in my case, I think that, that my compliance journey this last year was was pretty defining for my career in security leadership, which is something I, I fought for a decade to achieve. Um, it, it, you know, kind of proved me to future hiring managers and it proved me within my organization. And it was through that that I was able to to get headcount um, and own IT and get funding for my program, which I think that security resources hiring is something that's a huge challenge for people at companies of any size. Truth is that the security industry is under-resourced. There's no CSO in the world that, that wants to get hacked. It's a matter of the fact that fighting for headcount is really difficult for all of us because security is often seen as a cost center. I'm working to change that perception, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but yes, compliance is really great business, business proof. Um, compliance frameworks are also great for internal decision making. Again, um, executives often want to spend as little as they can on, on security and saying we need this to pass audits is often a lot easier than saying we need this to manage risks. Um, many compliance frameworks are pretty, pretty cut and dry and that's really valuable for navigating these discussions. And finally, this, this one's huge. Um, I think for startups and small business, Compliance, um, it's, it's an international mark of security maturity. It doesn't say that you're doing all the right things, but it shows that you're doing some of them. Um, so at my organization, it helped us win um, the first enterprise customer and more after that. Um, I know that our investors looked at our compliance reports when we got our Series B. And I think it's a real helpful tool for, for small businesses. That said, compliance frameworks, again, they're, they're not the same thing as best practice. There can be a huge difference. And I think the difference is getting bigger, especially as we've gone away from traditional networks to distributed um, ways of working, distributed systems. Frameworks don't always reflect reality. And at a lot of organizations, companies of all sizes, that can create a huge challenge. Um, there's a recent Shinakuni study that 99% of CISOs feel that compliance is outdated for the cloud landscape. 
Um, and it's really challenging because there's the need to um, kind of interpret standards and, and scope systems that's way harder than it's ever been. Um, there is a desperate need for compliance automation, which is a, a field that's really popping. Um, and not only are we having to pass more audits, it's, it's harder to get there. Um, and I think that the industry desperately needs leaders who know the difference between compliance and best practice. And this is the important part. We need leaders who have the courage um, to defend going above and beyond compliance to executives. And I'll talk a little bit about how I did that as well. You know, I think that for um, a lot of people here, people who are in security, people who are uh, breaking into security, people who are considering going into security, compliance is probably gonna be inevitable. There was a huge shift back into, um, I think it was 2008 in, in terms of compliance burdens. We can also blame it on Enron um, as well as, as recent hacks. The compliance burden at most organizations is getting bigger. Even at, at companies like mine, I'm not in a, a traditionally highly regulated industry like finance or healthcare. Um, technology vendors, software companies, which my company's in that space, were having to, to pass more audits. So the average um, CISO passes three to six audits a year, according to the same Shinakuni study. Um, most commonly high tech, PCI DSS and, and SOC 2. The, the cost of compliance when you dig into some of those studies are absolutely staggering. Um, you know, numbers vary wild, wildly depending on who you ask. I think the highest figure I saw was, was a KPMG study that said it's 10% of operating costs or more for 21% of businesses. We did not spend anywhere near that much, um, which I think is important, but it is still a huge operational burden. And last, I think this one is also important. If your organization is um, sells to businesses, essentially, if, you're, if your customers are other businesses, compliance is increasingly going to be a cost of doing business. 83% um, of organizations are investing in vendor risk assessment. Um, I don't want to name names, but SolarWinds. Um, I think that there has been things in the security ecosystem, um, especially in the last year, that have made organizations realize that they really need to be looking into vendor risks. Um, and that's why, you know, these, these audit reports are a highly valuable tool because it is one form of proof that you can give your customers that you're doing many of the right things or doing the bare minimum. And in my opinion, my unpopular opinion, compliance is extremely punk. Um, I think that compliance is, is wildly misunderstood. It has a reputation of being a checklist. It has a reputation of being boring. Um, I'm not claiming it's the same as security, but I, I really feel that there is um, some kind of resonance between compliance and, and the punk ethos. Um, a interview with Rick Reese, who is an amazing West Coast artist who has a lot of uh, kind of counterculture and, and skateboard influenced art, um, really summed up the idea, I think a lot better than I could. So I'm gonna point to Rick Reese's words, which is that punks um, and punk is subversive in how it rejects commodification, consumerism and corporate culture. In underground music, there's a real DIY ethos. If nobody's gonna help me, I'll do it myself. We speak truth to power, and we're, when we're not permitted to speak, we hold up a mirror. That's why I think countercultures are the most important agents of change. And I think this is really the crux of my talk. You know, I am here today to share my experience as a security leader at a, at a small business where we didn't have a huge compliance budget, um, having to kind of DIY compliance audits and, and how I succeeded. But I think that these, these lessons are important for everybody, especially individuals who have, at points in their lives have felt like they're on the periphery, have felt like they don't fit the mold, have faced rejection. I think that those of us who um, choose to not fit molds or, or just don't are important change agents and that the industry desperately needs us. I think that people who um, spark change are, are what gives me hope for the future. And I think that compliance is what it is, but it can be an amazing business tool 
for sparking change within an organization and growing support for security programs. The first thing I learned, I feel like as I became a security leader and started my compliance journey is that you cannot brute force executive buy-in. I think a lot of us get to our first security leadership job because we are detail oriented, we are analytical, we work really hard to prove that we're analytical. And so we come to meetings and we come to presentations prepared with data analysis that we've spent eight hours on. We have every industry and internal statistic to prove our case possible. And that is not always the most effective tactic, especially if it's the only one you're using. There is an amazing Gartner study annually on CISO effectiveness that asks, what are the top CISOs doing differently than their peers? And the most recent one said that one of the top five things that the effective security leaders do differently is they invest a lot of time and attention in building relationships with executives. They meet three times as often with executives and they meet with the, the, the marketing and sales team. Um, I, I have learned to become better at, at nurturing ideas. I, I plant a seed and I water it. I, I revisit ideas with executives and I really focus on the relationships. And I've learned to create kind of shared interest around common goals to create support for security in order to have the budget that I need and the headcount that I need. Um, I do work closely with our marketing team. I'm a SME for our marketing team on security and compliance and privacy and operating systems and a couple other things as well. Um, but I collaborate with them and I help them. I help them create resources and um, they, they help generate internal and external support for my efforts with uh, press releases about passing audits and security white papers and security website pages. Um, marketing is a critical relationship with, for me within my organization. Um, I am, have always worked closely with our sales team and in a couple weeks I'm going to do a, a training for all of our sales representatives so that they can sell security. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, when during the sales cycle should you bring up security? Because there's evidence to say you should be doing it sooner. How do you handle vendor risk assessment requests? What are the security benefits of our product and our product features? What are ways that you can upsell customers on security? Um, I think that's, that's super valuable because that allows me in the future to say, hey, security was a huge part of these deals. I'm not just a cost center. And that's <laughs> probably the most important one of the most important things I can do to, to get the funding that I need for my, for my program to do security right, um, because revenue really matters to executives. Um, something else I've done with the, you know, the sales team, like I mentioned, is I worked with our, our RevOps leader to figure out which of our deals security played a role in, in, in our audit reports. Right now, 20% of our enterprise customers or 20% of our revenue um, depends on successful compliance. And that is a, a stat I can bring up in these executive meetings. You know, if there's ever a question of what value I'm adding, it's a lot, it's a lot of revenue. It's a contractual obligation to these customers. And I think that um, that's, that was a really important relationship for me for sure. Something else we've noticed just really quickly is that the customers that are asking about security are often the customers that we want. Um, I think there's often a challenge where, you know, not every organization is aware of security, you know, in this kind of business to business space. And so that means that you can, you can educate them that that involves working with the marketing and sales team again, but you can also um, learn how to attract the customers that are, ready to have those security discussions. So again, data is not everything when it comes to um, winning executive buy-in. It, it is important, um, it's our relationships, but something I'm doing is measuring compliance and security using shared metrics, um, metrics that matter to other leaders in my organization. Again, I've calculated the ROI of compliance. I was able to say, you know, here's a super specific point in time when we we broke even on our audits. Now we're we're making money off our audits. We're making money off security. I am a, I am not a cost center. 
um, that is a really important kind of metric that I, you know, worked with RevOps to define. Um, something I measure, um, I try to measure it once a month as I use the CIS critical controls to honestly assess our maturity. And through that, I was able to define and prove the fact that our, our first audit cycle improved our maturity by 33% according to CIS critical controls. Here's what we need to do next. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways to measure it. Um, for us, CIS controls is, is one of the tools that makes sense. We also use OWASP SAMS, which is a fantastic school, uh, tool for benchmarking security maturity. Um, and through that, I'm able to show, you know, here's, here's what we've done. Here's what all the people who are helping with the audits have, have voluntarily done to, to improve our security posture. Um, if I have hiring needs, as always, I, I use the same kind of OWASP SAMs and uh, criti uh, critical controls tools to demonstrate how, you know, if we hire this person, here's how it's going to impact our maturity and risk. And I use similar calculations if I'm, I'm asking for an expensive piece of software. You know, here's, here's how it's going to impact risk and maturity. And I will often, often show as well, you know, here's what we could be spending. Um, another thing I learned is that you can't force an engineer to do anything. At any, any company of any size, compliance is going to involve a lot of people. It's going to involve a lot of collaboration. You're going to need evidence to submit to the auditor from the HR team, from the engineering product uh, DevOps uh, teams, executives as well. So in order to be audit ready, you, you need, you need buy-in and it's really not wise to force it. Um, you know, I have more authority than I did at the beginning of my audit journey, but I don't think that exerting kind of flexing that muscle of you have to do this is, is the best way to get anything done. I think that it is more effective to lead by influence. We have not, we're in the process of formally appointing team champions, but this is something you can do um, informally if you don't have that, that go ahead is understand who within each function at your organization is going to champion for you and really foster those relationships. Promote shared interests. Again, know how security matters to sales and make sure they have the sales enablement tools, the brochures, you know, the FAQs to sell, you know, your security benefits because that benefits you because you can prove revenue impact. Communicate value that matters to others. I think that we need all types of, of individuals in security, but we really need people who can communicate, communicate in terms that matter to the audience um, and communicate to different audiences. Build trust. I think that every security and compliance leader needs to build trust. Um, but if you're trying to you know, DIY an audit cycle on a tight budget, you really need trust. <laughs> um, my organization, a lot of our engineers come from open source backgrounds um, because we're in the Android space. A lot of them grew up on AOSP and other OSS projects. Um, and what that means is that privacy really matters. It matters to me and it matters to my engineers. So I've chosen to be aggressively transparent about controls and the fact that I intend long-term to defend employee and customer privacy rights. Um, and that actually was a huge way that I won buy-in and trust um, was being really, really transparent about my short and longer term, you know, data collection activities within the context of monitoring and my privacy values as well. Uh, a fourth thing that I think is a valuable tool for leading by influence is advocating for others at all levels of the organization you're gonna have a lot of tasks that you need to do to pass an audit. And you can do them yourself, which I did plenty of, <laughs> and you can also delegate. Um, and I think it's really important to consider whether there's opportunities to get delegate to uh, kind of junior employees, um, maybe recent grads, maybe other people in kind of junior roles. Is there something you can assign to people that 
that is an opportunity for them to have a high visibility win. Um, that was a really effective tactic for me. And I think it's an important way to build security and compliance experience internally and enable others to get that experience, that on the job experience that you yourself early in your career needed and, and had a hard time getting. You know, I think that many of us faced a lot of gatekeeping and it is our responsibility to remove barriers for others. And it's really great that it also helps you pass audits. Um, InnerSource is the best source. There is a ton <laughs> of documentation involved in audits. And I have been working and will continue to work to build an InnerSource culture of documentation. The term InnerSource was uh, coined by Tim O'Reilly. And it means using open source paradigms for internal processes. Um, open source is something that's super familiar. Um, to a lot of our engineers. So I think it was a good cultural fit. And it was also a necessity for us to pass audits quickly. Um, I think that our inner source documentation practice has has some work to do to become mature. But it was, it was what we did because we were resource strapped. So we were growing fast and we had a global team as well. So we established a hub for policies and SOPs. For us, we use Confluence as our wiki. Um, removed barriers for contribution to all. We brought up in the kind of monthly all hands meeting that everybody was invited to participate in this policy process. These policies need to work for all of us. Um, you know, policy was never presented as a top down thing. And I don't think it should be. Um, I think that policy should be a collective effort to figure out where you need controls. And, you know, there's also an effort of matching your controls to, to audit frameworks. Um, I am transparent about decision making. That's a huge part of, you know, inner source policy culture. Um, I will often share kind of V1 um, propose things and, and collect feedback. I wish I got more feedback, but getting some is, is a win. And I put in every effort I can to reward people who contribute to documentation. I don't think anybody's ever thought it was easy to get engineers to document their standard operating procedures and, and things like that. But if you've got a healthy, um, inclusive policy culture, it is easier for sure. Recognition and reward is a huge part um, of effective leadership, especially if you're trying to do audits on a budget. Because again, you, you need voluntary and cross-functional support. Um, I think that any compliance budget, no matter how big or small, um, and security budget needs funds for rewarding team members who are not, you know, don't have security in their job title. If they're helping security, try to make room in your budget for, um, you know, gift cards, uh, courses, other, other rewards and be public about how you recognize people who have taken action, added value, and, and created an impact. Sorry. I, I make time for recognition in security meetings, but I've also um, made a point of, of getting time in our all hands meetings with the whole company. And I use Slack as well to really make sure that I am recognizing people in public or internally in public. Um, I try to make a point of spotlighting uh, people who have, you know, exhibited great security behaviors, behaviors that are helping us on our audit journey. And I'm really loud. <laughs> you know, um, we have shout outs every Friday. I have a lot of shout outs. I think that it is important to have gratitude for others. And again, you know, recognize people who are contributing voluntarily and have really um, you know, stepped up and, and made impact. Communicate constantly. <laughs> um, I don't think any executive ever has complained about the fact that they are too up to date on a project status. So regular compliance project um, updates and security updates are really important. Um, especially if you're kind of in a high risk scenario where you have a tight budget, a tight timeline, something like that. Um, I think that, you know, kind of weekly updates 
perhaps for different audiences, executives, leadership, um, company-wide, should be at the core um, of kind of a compliance communication strategy. And even before you, you kick off your compliance project and assign tasks out in JIRA and stuff like that, start creating conversations with um, individuals from all teams at all levels of the organization. Start talking about your unified vision for security, how privacy matters to you long-term, how you have a vision for security never being a tool that gets in people's way, you know, enabling silent security in every scenario possible. Start having those conversations and define the vision for your, for your program. Um, impact of compliance is, is a huge thing to have conversations about. Talk about shared values. You know, again, for me, I brought up earlier that, that privacy is something that really matters to a lot of our, um, our teams. So talk about ways that your vision aligns with the vision of other teams. Automation is another thing that is a shared value for me and, and other technical leaders. And then finally, um, you know, just be really transparent about audit deliverables. Give people opportunities to step up and take on tasks and be and giving them the opportunity to own something and have impact. I think that a lot of us got to where we are because we were given opportunities to take on projects and, and do things. People trusted us. And as a leader, whether or not you have leader in your job title, I think it's really important to do that for others. Lesson seven, um, again, not selling anything. <laughs> There is a lot of um, open source and freemium tools for compliance, which is really helpful if you're on a budget. And I think that um, for all of us, building out compliance is, it's a question of, you know, what do I want to invest in now? You know, where does investment have the impact? Um, you know, where is open source a good long-term solution? And if I can't afford to cover this, these control areas with the tool I really want, what can I put in place that is compliant, it is secure, and is not too painful to rip out? Um, I've used many of the tools on this list, um, some of which I sourced from an amazing blog by, by Jupyter One. Um, and there's others that I have not used, but it's you know just a free air, uh, couple of different free things you can use. Um, Jupyter One is one of several organizations that has a GitHub full of security policies that you can take um, and adapt to your organization to pass audits if you don't have a dedicated compliance team. I am actually pretty new to discovering Google VSAC, but it's actually a tool for you to do um, assessments on your vendors, risk assessments, which is super awesome. Um, I do not use Wiser Training, I'm aware of it, um, but it is one free way to do security awareness training. Again, awareness should involve a lot of different communication styles and things. Um, so Wiser is, is one option that can be, you know, a valuable free tool within the context of other things. Um, some of our HR and administrative processes are, are handled through JIRA. We do employee onboarding through Jira Service Management. We do IT and security requests through that as well, access requests. Jira has a free, free version. And for us, uh, we're not on a free version. We're definitely on a paid version, but it was a tool that we could add that didn't involve another piece of software, another vendor risk assessment, another, another um, cost. Netflix Stethoscope is something I'm actively exploring. Um, it is a open source solution for um, device configuration management. Super cool. Um, WireGuard is a free VPN. I have not looked into Netflix Dispatch. I hope to do that um, just because I'm curious. Um, Bitbucket has a free version um, for change management. SNCC is a software composition analysis tool that has a, um, a free version as well. App Threat Terraform. Um, all the Amazon tools uh, for cloud security vulnerability monitoring. Um, have free versions to, to a point. Um, you may need more than free to pass your audits, but you know, there's a free option to explore them and figure out whether they work for your needs. We do use Burp Suite. Hacker Guardian is the cheapest vulnerability um, assessment tool that's, that's validated by the PCI DSS Council. I'm, so it's an option. <laughs> And 
and just kind of, um, you know, to sum things up, I think that compliance is not necessarily the goal for many of us. You know, we don't embark on our security careers or start to embark on security careers because we really want to do governance, risk, and compliance, not all of us, um, but we end up doing it. And I think that it can be a really positive thing because, again, compliance can be a tool for sparking change. And those of us who didn't always fit the mold are amazing change agents. If I had one request, it would be all, that all of us in the security industry try to stop saying that things are technical or not technical. It's not a binary valuation system, and I don't think it's the most effective valuation system. You know, even when I was in a computer science graduate program, um, as a woman, I faced a lot of times when I was labeled as not technical enough um, or assumed that I was not technical enough. And not only was that not true, it's just not helpful. Um, and I think that as, as we get to the point in our careers where we have a platform, we have you know initiatives, we have budget, we have a responsibility to stop labeling others or creating, you know, being gatekeepers by, by saying that people and things are not technical because it's just not helpful. Um, governance, risk, and compliance has a reputation of not being a technical security domain. And it's really not true now that we're trying to scale these um, kind of outdated frameworks to our mature dev DevOps um, and cloud programs. You know, automation and controls automation is playing a increasingly important role in compliance strategies. It's the only way you can do it when you have these, these massive and dynamic cloud environments. Um, so I think that it's important to stop judging, you know, compliance and compliance people as, as non-tactical because it's increasingly not true. And that does not go to say that people who don't have a background in coding have no role in compliance because we desperately need people who can communicate and document and lead programs and influence um, and, and do things like that. Saying a person is technical does not measure their impact. And often effective uh, security and compliance leaders are um, people who have impact in different ways. Almost everybody in security leadership roles is a masterful communicator, or they, or they probably need to be. Um, you know, again, there's a, a need for people who advocate for others, who commit to stopping the security industry's gatekeeping problem as much as they can. You know, I do not have <laughs> the same hiring budget by a long shot as people at much larger organizations. I have a limited number of hires I can make, but I can make small change even within that, that tiny headcount. You know, um, I'm currently hiring for a role that is a um, security support position um, to help people who are in help desk achieve a SOC analyst role. You know, even if you don't have a huge hiring budget, I think there's some room to create apprenticeships, give people, you know, experience and, and, and stuff like that. And at larger organizations, you've got the privilege to make, make much larger change. Um, and that's something we can all do. Um, effective leaders are relentless about how they set priorities. If you're doing a budget with, with not a, you know, or doing an audit cycle with not enough budget and, and, and resources, priorities are gonna be huge. Um, we need people who are agile and we need people who can learn, learn in real time and help others learn. I think that um, Carlotta Sage really kind of spoke to that this morning in a teen village panel that um, knowledge management is huge. So that involves people process and, and systems. It's about documenting, um, documenting ways that works for others and often being kind of an interpreter to help others around you understand as well. Speaking directly to people who are in security leadership roles and people who aspire to them, I think that we have some particular responsibilities. Um, I think that we should see compliance for what it is and understand that it's a valuable business tool for sparking change. Um, I understand that compliance is not everything my organization needs to be doing for security by a long shot, but compliance has been a really helpful tool for getting the budget and resources I need 
just for security and making security maturity progress. Um, you know, have the courage to educate yourselves and others on best practices. Have those conversations with your leadership team where you're like, here's, here's what we need to do for compliance. Here's what we should be doing. Um, educate people in your organization on, on the difference between security and compliance. And, and even more importantly, um, become a SME, uh, become a public interest technologist, join special interest groups or SIGs, um, and help um, create a next generation of standards that are more in line with best practices for cloud and multi-cloud environments. Um, there is no shame in using compliance, you know, as an internal tool for winning buy-in. Um, that's, I think, a highly effective tactic um, in a resource draft security industry. Um, you know, create better open source culture for, for compliance so that compliance is not a barrier to success for, for small organizations and startups. Um, there is a growing culture of, of people who are sharing policy templates, compliance templates on, on GitHub um, and creating kind of an open source culture around that. I think that, you know, if you're taking anything open source, whether it's code or a template, you should always validate whether it's, you know, effective and there's ways to do that. But I am here for creating a better open source compliance culture. And again, you know, give opportunities to others because you're going to need a lot of help to pass your audits. And it is an opportunity to, to break down barriers. Really quickly, um, if you aspire to security or considering um, a career in governance, risk, and compliance, um, don't give up. You know, don't change yourself to fit anybody's mold. I am a security director who does public speaking, and I have a neck tattoo. Um, I'm a first-generation college graduate, um, and I'm here. So I think that the security industry needs all types, and that those of us who have had different backgrounds and think differently are, are effective change agents. Um, if there was one thing I could change about my early career, I wish I was not so hard on myself. Um, I was building valuable experience in help desk in, in database analyst positions. And I also wish that I thought a little bit differently about breaking into security. You know, five years ago, cloud wasn't really considered security work, DevOps. I mean, who, who is here to define exactly what security is and, and isn't? other than maybe like, you know, the CISP domains. I think that security can involve a lot of job titles uh, and does involve a lot of job titles that don't have security in them. And I think that we should all be appreciative of ourselves and the fact that we're building experience. Um, and there are ways. It is not as easy to build GRC experience outside a job as it is perhaps for, you know, pen test or blue team, but there is ways. Volunteer with the standards organization like MITRA or Get yourself plugged into your local chapter of OWASP. Volunteer with open source projects. That's huge because, again, ton of documentation and process and compliance and audits. That's something you're going to build in open source projects. As a hiring manager, I specifically look for people who come from open source backgrounds, even if it's not anything to do with our product or organization, because these are people who can work in diverse global teams using asynchronous processes um, and, and mentor others and have a community mindset. Learn Git. Learning Git does not involve any any code, but I think it is it is a valuable tool for um, pretty much any security professional. Um, get a free GitHub account. Um, build a portfolio on there. You can create templates and and upload those to your GitHub. Carlotta Sage was actually the one that taught me that. That's super valuable. Write. You don't need to write poetry. You don't need to write like huge technical papers and get them published in, in journals. But think about improving your writing skills and whether you are able to communicate effectively to different audiences. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, yeah. Any questions? Yeah, we actually had uh, a couple people post questions during, so I'm going to go ahead and read the first one to you. Um, there are quite a few companies coming out with compliance solutions. 
Are you looking at some of these? And if so, do they look like they will help? Sure. Um, so I do have strong opinions on that. Um, and when I was putting together this presentation, I really tried to be as agnostic towards any paid solutions as possible because I'm not here to sell anything. I think a lot of compliance is, is process of people in leadership. Um, and that matters more in, 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 you know, in the real world than, than paid tools. That said, we do use a compliance automation solution that I am extraordinarily happy with, like love. It's called Jupyter One, um, which is kind of a, it's a sophisticated cloud asset inventory and, and controls automation tool. Um, and I did compare it to a lot of other things. Um, and I actually really love talking about compliance software. So if you would like to email me, hit me up on Twitter, LinkedIn, and, and ask me questions, like let's talk. Great question. Nice. Um, the next question was that came in during, was any advice for a customer defrauded by a rogue actor internal to a massive corporation who needs to get the audit committee of said corp to take them seriously? Um, I don't know that I actually, I apologize. Could you possibly share that the text of that over Slack so I can make sure I understand? Yeah, I can do that. Definitely. Thank What's you so that? much. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure I've never been in that situation personally, but, um, did you get the Slack? I did. Yeah. I'm looking yeah. at it right now. Thank you. Um, That sounds like a really challenging situation. I'm, I'm really, really sorry that happened. Um, I am not a lawyer. I would probably, you know, if it's an issue of fraud that you're dealing with from a vendor, I would probably talk to your legal counsel um, because they can dig into the specific contract and relationship and give much better and more prescriptive advice. That, that's always good advice, in my opinion. <laughs> Talk to legal. Um, and the uh, other question that came in is, could you please explain more about volunteering in standards organizations? Sure. Um, so uh, there's a lot of different standards, some of which are um, put together by employees, um, PCI DSS, um, you know, has employees. They also have industry subject matter experts. Um, so there's different ways that standards are put together. Um, however, there is ways to get involved with um, different standards organizations with varying levels of experience. Joining an OWASP chapter would be a great example of that. Um, and I, my mind just completely went blank because I'm absolutely <laughs> exhausted. But there is, um, yeah, there's there's different ways to do that as well. OWASP SAMS is another project that you can get involved with. That is, um, it's it's basically software development lifecycle security. There's different open source um, contribution positions you can take with that. Um, I am not totally sure if, if Mitra has has volunteer positions or just employees, but. Um, I would look at different standards you're you're interested in and figure it out if they have chapter meetings, if they have conferences, if they have open source projects that you can contribute to um, as one, you know, way to influence the um, future of of these standards. Yeah, totally. Um, I don't see any additional questions, just last call for questions. Um, and if not, please fill out the survey. Please visit the expo hall because we're about to go on break and looking forward to seeing everybody back on the stages, I guess, uh, in uh, just over an hour. Thanks so much, Jasmine. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Leah. Take care.